Shalom. I hope that you are well and have been uplifted by this season of Passover. In the special holiday prayers of the festival of Pesach, in the Musaf additional prayer, we recite the words, Hashem our God, bestow upon us the blessing of your appointed time for life and peace, for joy and gladness, as you desire to promise that you would bless us. This is very deep. God promised that each of his appointed times brings its own special blessing to each person, that during these times he would send his own unique blessing. What a beautiful promise. That blessing can be manifest in many ways, both seen and unseen, and it can be time-released, meaning it can take us a while to recognize what we have. May we merit to realize how great a blessing we have all received over this Passover. Shabbat this week is the Sabbath of the blessing of the upcoming new moon of Iyar, which will occur next Friday. And this week's Torah reading is Parshat Shemini, beginning in Sefer Vayikra, the book of Leviticus, chapter 9. To understand the context of the beginning of our portion, we need to rewind in our minds back to the beginning, the first day of this month of Nisan. Shemini means the eighth, referring to the eighth day, which was Rosh Chodesh Nisan, the day of the culmination of the week-long dedication ceremony of the tabernacle in the desert. This day was the climax of the joyous inauguration of the tabernacle. So, speaking of being uplifted, this day is described in our holy tradition as such a great day, so high, the highest of the high, to the extent that it could be said that in many ways everything had been leading up to this point. Rosh Chodesh Nisan. This was the day in which God's goal in creation, to have an abode for himself in this world, began to be fulfilled. On this day, when the tabernacle became a reality and God's presence was welcomed into the world, the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, took up residence among the children of Israel, as it were, and we started to get ourselves back to the garden. It was the very first day that Aaron and his sons, the Kohanim, donned their priestly garments, officiated in the divine service, and blessed the people with the priestly blessing. This was the day upon which the divine fire descended from heaven upon the altar. All this is the background of the tragic and untimely death of Aaron's sons Nadav and Avihu, who on this occasion were so transfigured by the sheer ecstasy of the realization of God's presence, but erred gravely and fatally in their understanding of how to live with that presence and incorporate it into everyday reality. It's very important not to make the common mistake of thinking that these two great men were in any way found unworthy or sinful or anything other than truly righteous, for that is what they were. This is made crystal clear by Moshe's words to Aaron, chapter 10 and verse 3. This is what Hashem spoke, spoke of when he said, I will be sanctified through those who are nearest to me. Thus, I will be honored before the entire people. This was a statement that Hashem had made to Moshe previously, privately, on Mount Sinai. And Moshe never did know who Hashem was referring to until now. He told Aaron, I thought God must have been speaking about you or me, but all along he meant your sons, Nadav and Avihu. They were perfect tzaddikim, righteous men, but even tzaddikim can make a mistake. So how can we understand what happened here, what went wrong, even on a simple level? First, we need to plug into the level of consciousness, of revelation, that the entire nation achieved at this moment. The source of the unparalleled, unprecedented level of joy that was so palpable. The key verse to, under, to our understanding is the last verse of chapter 9, verse 24. A fire went forth before Hashem and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fats. The people saw and sang glad song and fell upon their faces. This is an amazing and singular expression in Hebrew, vayaronu, they sang glad, glad song. The entire nation, inspired by the reality of the living presence of God among them, in total, real, honest humility, fell on their faces, which is an expression of the nullification of the self, because they felt the wholeness of being part of Hashem. And they sang glad song because they heard the music of the universe like never before. They heard the soundtrack of life. They felt that they themselves became the music. So Nadav and Avihu never wanted this moment to end, this high, this total, all-encompassing perception of reality. They were high, and they never wanted to come back down. 
They wanted to grab this moment and bind with it, to be a part of it, to be it, to enter into it and express to Hashem their love for Him. But their mistake was in thinking that they needed to do something extraordinary, something in the language of the verses in which they had not been commanded, a strange fire. The Torah wants us to be high, all right, and always be in this moment of rarefied perception, and always feel and realize the reality of our being bound to the wholeness of Hashem. But this is precisely the purpose of the mitzvot. Living a simple life of listening to Hashem's music, the commandments, is the real source of ecstasy and living with the Divine Presence. But it did not suffice for Nadav and Avihu. Thus, Torah goes out of its way in this portion to give us a profound lesson. So open up your hearts in the deepest way. It is amazing that there are only two themes in this Torah portion. The death of Nadav and Avihu and the laws of kashrut, the laws of keeping and eating kosher. If we can open up our hearts in the deepest way, this unusual juxtaposition certainly signals to us, jumps out to us, that there has to be a deep, deep connection between these two ideas. The entire chapter 11 of our Torah portion of Shemini deals with the laws of kashrut, the laws of keeping and eating kosher. Now, it's a total misunderstanding to label or to think of these laws as the kosher dietary laws. This is actually so much more than a diet and more than a healthy lifestyle. It's really absurd to call it that. By calling it a a diet prescribed by the Torah for Israel, it can be asserted, and as some people do erroneously, that these laws only had bearing back in ancient times because conditions were primitive back then before refrigeration, as if this is only about sanitation or prevention of disease. So open up your heart. As we always emphasize, Torah is not about do's and don'ts. It's not about restrictions and rules. This is about falling on our faces and singing glad song. This is about enabling us to be able to hear the music, the song of the universe. The laws of Kashrut represent a different worldview in which we are part of something so big, so great. It's a holistic worldview of our place in the universe. And this is more than most people are used to thinking or are comfortable thinking. It's the difference between my seeing everything as being all about me, what's in it for me, it's all about me, as in my pleasure, I'm at the center, which also implies the minimization of everything else but me and my self-centered non-responsibility for both myself and the world around me. The laws of Kashrut are the opposite of all this. Kashrut is on the wavelength of What if everything, every thought, word, and deed has significance? What if it all means something, not only something, but so much? What if everything goes somewhere and is registered and makes its mark forever on this universe, both on the individual and on the cosmos? What if we are connected to the world in ways that we can't even imagine? You are what you eat. You are what you do. You are what you think. Indeed, everything has meaning. Torah teaches that eating is a very spiritual, very powerful endeavor with great potential for both holiness and for total undoing, unraveling, dehumanization. We are taught that every level of creation contains a divine spark that's hidden, the spiritual essence, the soul of the matter. What we eat is no exception. In fact, in Torah thought, the reason that eating can be a powerful spiritual tool and lead to potential holiness is because of our ability to elevate these divine sparks by eating in purity and by thanking and recognizing God as the provider of our needs and by eating with the proper intention. When we eat in this manner, we peel away the layers of concealment that cover over the holy essence. And just as the physical aspect of food nourishes our bodies, the spiritual aspect nourishes our souls. And we, in turn, can elevate can literally redeem the hidden aspect of holiness within the seemingly dormant level of the inanimate food that we eat, and thus we strengthen the song of the universe. But some foods were never intended by the Creator to be eaten because they have negative spiritual energy, like bats and eels and wolf pups and all the things that were being sold and eaten at the wet market at Wuhan, China. And not only can the essence of these things not be elevated, They are so dense that they cause one who eats them to lose ground spiritually. They bring a person down. They literally cloud the mind and dull the senses, erecting a barrier between our souls and God. Bottom line, quite frankly, if your heart is open to hear, 
eating what is forbidden by Torah, forbidden by Hashem's love and compassion, eating these things destroys man and wreaks havoc on creation. That's what the rules of Kashrut are really all about. Not a diet, but a spiritual path of enlightenment and universal elevation, like all of the Torah's commandments. Torah states in our parsha, You shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping creature that creeps, and you shall not defile yourselves with them, that you should become unclean through them. For I am Hashem your God, and you shall sanctify yourselves and be holy because I am holy. And you shall not defile yourselves through any creeping creature that crawls on the ground. For I am Hashem your God who has brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy because I am holy. Everything that we do and don't do, God is telling us, is an aspect of our responsibility to Him to keep ourselves in a fit condition for the mission with which we have been entrusted. God uses an unusual word in verse 44, which we have just recited, Vehit kadashtem, which we have here translated as, Thus you shall be holy, but it really means work at making yourselves holy. Meaning, put all your energy into that task and fight against anything that stands in your way. Vehit kadashtem, and thus Hashem promises, you will become holy. The opposition within you will diminish more and more. It will fall away. The internal struggle against your base animal drive will become less and less so that ultimately you will reach the state when all which is ignoble and impure, that which would pull you down and away from God, will have lost its attraction for you. I am holy, God states. And for you to reach an ideal state of freedom from the forces that bind you, is the reason I took you out of Egypt in the first place for you to work at becoming holy. And if you work at becoming holy, you shall be holy. That is why you should work, because I am holy. If you want to be near me, he's saying, you have to be in harmony with me. And because I am holy, you can become holy. Thus the amazing connectivity of our Parsha. Open up your heart. This is the greatest answer to the tragedy of Nadav and Avihu. The holiness of an elevated existence is daily within our reach through the simple things of listening to what God tells us. The life within us is the breath of life breathed into our nostrils by God. And with that breath, these laws of kashrut raise us above physical compulsion and they protect our sensuousness from unrestrained animal passion. Through these rules, kashrut, God herein bequeaths to Israel the power of self-determination, the ability to become master over the pettiness of our own material nature. These laws beckon to us. Thus says God, as I reign over the world, you can reign over yourselves. You can do this. Eating these forbidden foods leads one to become dull and desensitized. The Torah here warns us, do not make your souls an abomination and do not defile yourselves. The eating of forbidden foods increases the desire to be satisfied by things prohibited by the will of God. And at the same time, it brings tumah, impurity, to the whole of the person. And what is this impurity? It's the lack of moral freedom. Our very morality is weakened by eating foods which are forbidden by the Torah. To make the soul abominable means that through eating these forbidden things, immoral desires are increased. And tuma, impurity, means that we are no longer masters over ourselves, but rather we become slaves to our passions. Becoming impure through these things means that we have become completely ruined. For many years, I've had the honor and privilege of teaching Torah to Gentiles as well as to Jews, to non-Jews of great dedication who have come to love the God of Israel and his Torah, righteous souls and greatly beloved souls who seek simply to please him and follow his commandments to the best of their ability. I've met many people who come from backgrounds that are very different and varied, who come from far away, who are raised sometimes in diametric opposition to the values of Torah, even raised with attitudes predisposed against the teachings of Torah, and yet, with great dedication and love and commitment and integrity and true spiritual bravery, these people leave pagan ideas behind and become completely new. They take a bold stand for the God of Israel, sometimes at great personal cost. Sometimes the price they pay is alienation of family, of children or grandchildren, of parents. Yet they are undeterred in their spiritual odyssey, their journey towards a relationship with Hashem, the God of Israel. And I can't count how many times I've asked people, 
How did you manage to break away from false and idolatrous notions? How did you have the courage to turn your back on the falsehoods you had been taught? What separated you from others? How did it all start? How did your relationship with the one God of Israel begin, if you could recall a turning point? And people relate that they started to read the Tanakh and they started to ask questions and they began to confront difficult doctrinal or theological issues and demand answers. But invariably, they always say, you know how this started for me? I'll quote from one letter that I received that speaks for countless others. This lady writes, What opened my eyes, how I was able to begin to see? I started eating clean, like the Torah says. I reasoned that even though maybe it's only Israel who God commands, it can't be good for anybody if he doesn't like it, if he doesn't want it for his people. And then... Once I stopped eating those things that the Torah calls abomination, my whole level of understanding changed. It's like the scales were removed from my eyes, and I was able to understand Torah on a completely different level. It's like Hashem was speaking to me clearly. I'm still quoting the letter. The woman writes, Once I began to be careful to eat only clean, it's like I could hear the music of the universe. Shalom. Please remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. If you enjoy these presentations and benefit from these teachings, please consider helping Jerusalem Lights with your support. Only your support enables these broadcasts to continue and grow.